Greetings hobbyists, this is Artisans of Vool. And in this video, we're gonna have a look at what technology you should be using to bring your 3D designs to life. Over a number of videos now, I've got quite a few requests of people asking me, what do I use to do my 3D printing? And what is the best choice? And that's quite a difficult thing to answer. Firstly, because there's a number of options available to you. And two, because actually some of the advice you'll find out there online is a little bit outdated and some of it's really outdated. So what I thought I'd do is a video having a look through what technology or what choices is gonna be best for bringing your designs to life. And we're gonna have a look at three technologies. We're gonna have a look at resin printing, we're gonna have a look at filament printing, which is generally plastic, and we're gonna have a look at a third option as well, which I had never really considered. I had a lot of quite bad information about it. So I think it's really important to cover it and it might be the thing that actually you're looking for. So stick around to the end of the video for that bit. But we're gonna start with the resin and filament printers, and we're gonna have a look at the generally thought through positives and negatives, and then we'll have a look at if they actually still hold up, and hopefully that will give you an idea of what is the best choice for you. So here's my Saturn III Ultra, and let's get started with this table. And the first thing is, yes, the first statement is entirely right. As you can see from these pictures, these are all prints that I've done myself. If you are worried about the best resolution, the finest detail on tiny miniatures, you want to go with resin printing. You will not get to finer detail from filament printing. And the second point that probably needs to be dealt with is the layer lines. If you're reading something about layer lines, then this is old information. There are very few 3D printers that are current on the market that if you set them up properly will show any form of layer lines as hopefully you can see from these prints. And for fun, if you want to have a go at guessing which parts of both these tanks were 3D printed, feel free to have a go in the comments section and I will let you know if you're right. So that is something you don't really need to worry about. Next on the list is that the prints are more bristle. They're more likely to snap or crack or break. And that is a fair comment. Resin is, by its very nature, more brittle, and there is a good chance that if you do something with it, like drop it, it's going to shatter into many pieces. It also means that really thin parts can be particularly fragile. Though at the same time, that's not necessarily always true now. You get a massive range of different resins that are available on the market, some of which are particularly flexible. For example, as you can see from this spear that I printed, using an Amerilabs resin, you can flex that massively without it breaking. It will just return back to its normal shape or you can speed up the process by flexing it back there yourself. So there are a massive range of resins available which can get rid of that brittleness. The other criticism of a lot of 3D printers, both resin and filament, is they're not necessarily plug and play. You can't just set them up, get them going and they'll work fine. You need to do some work testing the printing quality and getting it to the best point for your environment. And there is an element of truth to that for sure. Though again, there are more and more printers becoming available that don't have that problem, but you're gonna pay more for them. A good example of that would be the Hay Gears printer that I'm showing on the screen now. Now I'm not gonna go into lots of different resin printers. I'd really suggest checking out a blogger called Fohammer. He does excellent review videos if you're looking at what 3D printer to get. But the Hay Gears printer has basically proprietary resins and bottles, which means that everything is set up ready to go. You basically have to do almost nothing. You just put the models in, it will support them for you, and then print it perfectly, with you having to do next to no input yourself. The other complaint of resin printers is there's a lot of hidden costs. And I don't think they're necessarily that hidden now. People are well aware of them. But they are there and you do need to know about them. You will need a place to cure your resin prints, either you buying something or jury rigging something yourself, which is very doable. And they will therefore vary in cost. You'll also have a constant cost, not just of the resin, but you need IPA to try and clean your prints. You can get water washable resins, but honestly, I wouldn't go near them. Every single one I've tried has been absolute trash. And if you're gonna be cleaning resin, you don't really want that going into the water supply down a sink anyway, if you've got any level of environmental responsibility. So I wouldn't advise that. But you will need to use IPA, and you will need a good supply of nitrile gloves, not latex. 
IPA will go through latex. They're not hugely expensive, but they are an additional cost that you are gonna have. So the hidden cost statement is pretty valid. The other thing you'll hear is that resin printers are generally quite messy. I'd say that's fair. Maybe I'm just lazy at cleanup or clumsy, but this is my work area and you can see it's a bit of a state. Now, admittedly, I've had this printer going pretty much since I got it, which is a year and a half ago, and I don't think there's been many weeks where I haven't been printing at least one or two print runs, and there's been many weeks where I've been printing many print runs pretty much constantly for a week if I've had the time available. So quite regularly, I'll get to the point where I haven't kept everything clean. Now there are ways of mitigating that. For example, I really love these dog feeding trays. I will put a link to everything that I've used in the description. So feel free to check that out. There'll be some affiliate links there. So if you wanna help support the channel, feel free to buy from there. I'll put up some resins that I've used as well. And if you're interested in any videos on different types of resins that I've used, feel free to say in the comments section, always happy to do videos that help people out but the messiness is something you just can't avoid. A similar point would be that there's smelter resin printing, and that leads us nicely onto our last point. The chemicals that are used in 3D printing for resin are toxic. You should not be touching the resin with your bare hands until it is properly cured. And while it is said that the smell of these resins is perfectly safe, I find that if I'm constantly breathing them in, I get quite a sore throat. And it just makes me think that maybe I don't want to be leaving that out. So I actually have something to test the quality of the air when I do my resin printing, and that's always there. I also print in my shed because I'd rather not have that inside. So if you don't have an outdoor space available to you, then maybe this isn't the way of creating the 3D designs for you. And then being in a shed creates its own problems of it being heated or it getting colder and you not being able to actually do your resin printing. Now there are solutions around that. I've got a video that you can see. Again, it's linked in the description if you wanna check that out of how you can print in the winter. And I print all through the winter using this method. So it is perfectly doable. And a lot of the more recent printers actually have some form of heating included. And there's some debate about what's the better version of that. I actually quite like the new Anycubic, which has a way of heating the resin directly, though then you have some potential cleanup issues if you want to change resin types. But again, this potential level of hazard can be really off-putting, especially if you have pets, children, and again, it leads to there being some additional costs that you need to take into account. For example, I use a dust mask or a painting mask to make sure that I'm as safe as possible. And then we come on to filament printing, and this is my Ender 3 V3 from Creality. And similar to the Saturn 3, it's been an absolute workhorse. I've had this for maybe five months now, and again, it is very rare for this not to be printing. And at some points, for literal two or three weeks on the trot without pause. And if you want something that's gonna be creating a more rugged product, that's going to be more resilient if you're gonna drop it, especially good for 3D printing terrain, this is where you wanna be. You want to be looking at the filament printers. They also have the benefit that they are relatively cheap and the filament is cheap. Now, it might look from this that you've actually got quite a lot of filament going into each one of these pieces, but actually as part of the slicing software, these are pretty much semi-hollow. You have a certain amount of infill, which means that actually they're really quite light as pieces and they also don't use a huge amount of filament. If you wanna check out a video of how well this works for creating 3D printable terrain, it's where the clip I'm showing you now comes from and hopefully you'll find that quite informative. Overall, this means that filament printing is going to be cheaper and it means that if you've got something that doesn't need a lot of detail and it's gonna potentially take a few hits and knocks, filament would generally be the way to go. You also don't just have to use PLA. There are other printers as well available that aren't necessarily open printers that can do things like print in other substances. And some of those substances are even more resilient. So if you want to check that out, again, Fauxhammer is a really good source of information, but I'd especially recommend a channel called Aurora Tech, and they go through every single printer in exactly the same way, and therefore is quite useful to have a good comparison. Now, as I've kind of indicated, one thing you do need to be aware of is print lines or layer lines for filament printing. And they are relatively unavoidable. Even the top end printers at the moment will create some fine layer lines. Now, for example, the Ender 3 V3 does create some slight print lines. They're very easy to get rid of, especially for terrain. You just use a self-leveling spray 
or you can get some quite high-end 3D printers. I've heard amazing things about the printers from Bamboo and them having vastly reduced layer lines. So that is true, there are layer lines that you are gonna to need to be aware of. You need to determine if that's a big problem for you and your project. Now in a similar vein to the resin printers, the idea that filament printers aren't plug and play is kind of semi-true. Again, for a lot of the older ones and even some models that are for sale now, that is a valid statement. But the Ender 3 V3, I pretty much plugged it in and it was ready to go straight away. It did everything itself, it self-leveled, it was fantastic. And again, those printers from Bamboo are well known for being pretty much plug and play. So I'll give that a half correct, half incorrect as a statement. You just need to do your research there, but it definitely doesn't have to be true. And the last point for these printers also is gonna get a similar partially true and partially not, in that you need to constantly be tinkering with them to get the best out of them. Again, very true for older filament 3D printers, not really true for the ones that are now very much plug and play. So do be careful with what you're getting. I will be clear, I have had one problem with this 3D printer, which is when the end got blocked. I found a video on YouTube, I followed it and deconstructed the print head. It took me about 20 minutes to take it apart, clear the block and put it back together again. And to be fair, if you can do something at the level of Meccano, you're pretty much good to go. I will also put a link to that video in the description. It's not my video, but it was really, really helpful to know what you've got to do. And if you're thinking of buying a printer like this, it gives you an idea of what might be involved if you need to unblock something. And as I say, I've had that happen once while printing pretty much constantly with this four months and it was relatively easy to solve and it didn't actually damage any parts and I just got straight back to printing after about 20 minutes. And that leads us on to our mystery technology, which I said I'd cover at the end. And as I said, this was a massive shock to me. I'd heard a few things about laser cutters and made even more assumptions, and a lot of them have turned out to be pretty wrong. So this is the S1 from Xtools, and it is absolutely amazing. It has totally changed my mind about laser cutting as a tool for 3D design. And let's start with the first thing on our list. It is fast like insanely fast in comparison to 3D printing. For example, this wall, which I just designed as a test piece, printed in under 15 minutes, which bearing in mind that to do a wall of this height is gonna take maybe several hours in a 3D printer is absolutely game-changing if you want to design things fast. Now with that technology that allows this to be fast, using in this instance a diode laser, we would expect this to be more expensive. And let's be clear, the tool is expensive. At the moment, the Xtool S1 is about £1,600 in the sale. And I have to say, it does constantly seem to be on sale, so I'd expect around that price. Now, this is more expensive than the lower end 3D printers. There's no doubt about that. But if we start looking at the more high end printers like the Bamboo X1 Carbon, there's not such a massive difference in price point. But the other thing that we need to consider is the materials that go into the products. For example, our filament is generally pretty cheap, but it's nothing in comparison to the cost of the MDF that goes into a laser cutter, which means after the cost of the initial purchase, it's so much cheaper to be producing things with a laser cutter and it's faster. Now the next two points are where I think this gets really interesting and where I had the biggest surprise. Let's go back to that test part that I originally produced and this is kind of what I've been led to believe is what you can get from a laser cutter. You see products from places like TT Combat where everything is made up of lots of flat sheets and it starts to look pretty dull and you think you can't get as much from a laser cutter than you can for something like a 3D printer. And again, it does have to be relatively flat. Though I will say that the S1 can actually engrave on curved surfaces and it does that all itself very easily. This is an insanely easy machine to use. You basically can't go wrong with it and there's no tinkering like you would have with a 3D printer. But the most exciting bit for me was when I started doing test cuts and test engravings, I very quickly found out that your end products do not need to be perfectly flat. As we can see from this test engraving piece, I'll put a link to this in the description as well, you can actually get different depths when you do your engravings, and that means you have all of the options of different heights. For example, in this test piece, which is basically the same as the original one, but I put some difference in depth, 
I made the grouting between the bricks a lot deeper and then I added some of the bricks being slightly further down and you can see this allows you to add a really nice stone-like texture onto the surface. So do not think that you just need to end up with a flat end product. You actually get a really versatile set of options with something like the S1 that allows you to produce much more interesting end pieces with a much more interesting end result. Now the one thing that we can't get away with with the S1, as well as it being quite big, let's be clear about this, these are not small products with additional width as opposed to height, but like resin printers, you are going to need to have some form of ventilation or have it placed outside. Now again, the S1 has that really sorted. It comes with this automatic system that allows you to vent really effectively from the device out a window. And in addition to that, it's probably the most fun bit that I had with this when I originally opened all of the packaging because it comes with these ridiculous feet that stop the vibrations, but it allows you to just jiggle it around in the most satisfying way. I don't know why I found that so hilarious, but I just couldn't stop playing with it. But there definitely is an element of smell, which means you do want that ventilation. That does vary from product to product. For example, you can do really cool things like laser engraved glass or acrylic, or even things like slates. For example, I made this coaster for some friends that have a podcast, but I wouldn't be having this in my living room, for example. The last thing I wanted to address was do you need anything like specialist software to use laser cutters? And the answer is, well, yes, you're gonna need the software that comes with the product, or you can use some sort of generic software like Lightburn. But for example, with the S1, the software comes free on the website, so you don't really need to worry about an additional cost there. And it's amazing software. You can do fantastic things like check the placement of everything, showing where you've got space on an already cut piece of material so that you can go back to that and it will show you where that is on the computer screen and then mapping out where that's gonna cut before you actually do the cut. You really can't go wrong with this. Everything is so clear and easy to use. And as for the designs that you're gonna be cutting or engraving onto your material, you can either do that in the software itself or excitingly, you can just bring in something like a picture, especially things like an SVG. And what gets me really excited about that is that you can make SVGs very simply and easily in Blender. And in fact, you can add a lot of different levels to that, putting different colors onto the SVGs to say things like, I want to cut this or engrave different parts to those different heights, which means that this is very, very easy to use if you're already a Blender user for other 3D design products. So here's the end table, just so you can have a look at that final outcome. Like I said, I'm not making any recommendations here. The aim of this video is just to allow you to have a look at the different technologies that are available to you and allow you to think what's gonna be better for the products you're designing. I also wanted to shed some light on some of the typical things that get said about each of these technologies, just to give you an idea of where we are as always, I hope you found that video useful. If you think it's worthy, please do give it a like so more people can see it and get some ideas about what they can do with their 3D designs. If you're not subscribed to the channel, subscribe. And in the future, I will be doing a video showing how you can get the SVGs off of Blender in different colors to allow you to do things like laser cutting, but also for other uses as well. So do make sure you subscribe for that. Have a great day, guys.